Hello and welcome back to Radio 2. So we're officially starting with a new chapter today, as well as a new module, module 2.10. And we're starting with chapter 17 in your textbook, Beyond Powerful Radio by Valerie Geller. And this is about storytelling. So storytelling is the crux of being a great radio presenter. So that's literally what will define you from being a mediocre presenter to being a great presenter. OK, storytelling is something that's not purely used on simply the radio or the TV. Um, it's something that is used in pretty much everything that we do in, in our day to day lives. Think about when you tell your friend about something that happened, that's storytelling. OK, so if you think that you're naturally not the greatest storyteller, never fear. The great thing about storytelling is it's something that you can get back better at. It's something that has a lot of tips uh, that we can teach you in order for you to become a better storyteller. And that's what we're going to be doing in the next three lessons, okay? So we're taking in the next three classes with the aim of making you a better storyteller. But before we get into it, I want to show you one of the big master storytellers Paul Harvey. So we're just going to listen to one of his stories. Um, there's a lot. There's a lot out there that you can go and Google and go and look at. Um, in fact, something that I would like you to do is to go and look at Paul Harvey, read a couple of his stories or listen to a couple of these stories and pick your favorite and then figure out why that specific story is your favorite. What is it that separates it from the rest for you? Now, the rest of the story. Remember these four words, Al was utterly useless. Al was utterly useless. I'm nothing but a burden on my family. He once told his sister in a letter, really, it would have been better if I had never been born. Al had hit bottom by the age of 22. His parents, impoverished, were no longer able to support him. He needed a job, but nobody would hire him. In desperation, Al appealed to an old school friend, a fellow whose class notes he used to copy. The friend's father had government connections. And a few days later, Al was being interviewed for a position at the Federal Patent Office. Fred Haller was then director of the agency. He would conduct the interview personally. Haller informed the young man that he needed personnel capable of judging whether a request for a patent had any justification. What do you know about patents, the director asked, and Al replied, nothing, nothing at all. The director blinked a couple of times. Ordinarily, he would have terminated the interview then and there, and yet there was something intriguing in the young man's frankness. Tell me a bit about yourself, the director asked, and Al forced a smile. What was there to tell? He'd been thrown out of high school at 15. With no high school diploma, college was out of the question. So he applied at a technical school, but then he flunked his first entrance exam. So he went back to high school, a different high school, actually because his old high school refused to readmit him. Now this time he graduated. He was even accepted thereafter at technical school. But when prospective employers subsequently discovered that he had cut classes chronically, and that he had passed exams only narrowly and had treated professors irreverently, well, nobody would hire him. Nobody would hire him. And now here he was in the federal patent office asking for a job for which he was not qualified. What kind of a loser could summon up that kind of nerve? But Director Haller was not so certain. Yes, he had heard all of the reasons why he should not hire Al, but what he wanted to hear now were all of the reasons why he should. You know what? That interview continued for most of two hours, and by the time it was over, the director had come to this conclusion. Al was not stupid. He was simply a failure. If he were ever to stop failing and make something of himself, he would first require a large dose of self-confidence. So Director Haller decided to give Al a break, a probationary job as technical expert third class. You see, though posterity's impression of Al is larger than life, 
he was not destined to guide lesser minds through space and time. In fact, at 22, he stood at the brink of utter obscurity. And then he got that job at the Swiss Federal Patent Office. And inspired by his very first unequivocal success, he eventually learned to live up to his best, his very best, and to become the groundbreaking genius the world now knows as Albert Einstein. Only now, only now you know the rest of the story. And now you also know the rest of the story. So the background of Albert Einstein. So do you see what he did there? He started off this whole story. You had no idea who he was talking about or where he was going to until pretty much the ending where he wrapped everything up. And with that, we're starting this lecture about storytelling. I want you to think about something. So picture this. You turn on your car about to leave for work. You switch on the radio as you would every day and you put the volume a little bit louder for the background noise while you drive. Suddenly you pause, put the sound louder, put your car in neutral and lean back in your chair. For a moment you don't care whether you'll be late for work or not because you're captivated. Um, the topic on the radio has literally captivated you to a point of having your attention 100%. So, what is this topic? What are they talking about? What are the angles of the topic? Think about it from a storytelling perspective. Why is it that you are so invested in this story that you don't really care if you're going to be a minute or two late for work? When you start communicating for a living, you work in what is called the story business. The purpose of storytelling is to entice the listener, to make the audience want to find out what happens next. It's not all that different from all of our childhood fairy tales. You know, those once upon a time in a far off land, um, there was a princess and a monster. Then one day, dot, 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 all those stories. We as human beings love stories. We learn through them from the time that we are children and we continue the tradition as adults. Most people find it very hard to resist a good story. If well told, they make us laugh, they make us entertained, or they make us feel entertained. Um, they teach us about life and importantly, remind us about our humanity. Storytelling is one of the key points in the proven creating powerful radio or creating powerful communicators process. And that is focus, engage, opinion or position and storytelling. There are those who are naturally powerful storytellers and the art of powerful storytelling is a talent. Any topic in the hand of a truly talented master storyteller can come alive and captivate the audience, but the craft of storytelling is a skill that can be taught. No matter what your level of talent, anyone can become a better storyteller. At the moment, we're sitting with a situation where the pace is accelerating. Because nearly everyone has access to media and technology, it's your well-honed ability to tell stories within the limits of your medium, whether that's radio or TV, um, podcasting, whatever it might be, that will allow you to get an audience and to keep that audience's attention. In an over-communicated world where media is democratized and mobile and everyone can be a broadcaster at this point, literally everyone can, or a producer or a publisher or a director or an actor or even a storyteller. In a time when anyone from virt virtually anywhere can create and send pictures, um, words, moving images and audio from anywhere else and to anyone else, one person or billions, good storytellers will rule. Because of the amount of communication tools that are available to us, audiences are overwhelmed. Think about yourself. You can't even take in a quarter of all the information that's out there for you on a day-to-day -day basis. 
there's so many choices, what to read, what to watch, what to listen to, what to comment on, what to interact with. At the end of the day, though, it doesn't matter if it's a tweet, if it's a post, if it's a sales presentation, if it's not a good story, it won't get attention. The creating powerful radio workshop mantra is this. There are no boring stories, only boring storytellers. Whether you work as a broadcaster or whether you're going to work as a broadcaster um, or any type of communicator, your job will likely involve powerful storytelling. So it's really important that you understand how to tell a powerful story. So the storytelling trainer and consultant Jeffrey Hedquist has this to say. Everyone, whether parents, teachers, managers, journalists, salespeople, advertising and marketing executives and entertainers, all use stories. We either do it haphazardly or with skill and effectiveness. You can use this inherent, powerful, tribal communication skill to your advantage to influence, motivate, educate, sell, and entertain your audience. We've gone through the basics of storytelling before, the who, what, where, when, um, why, how. We've looked at the beginning, the middle, and the end. But it's the way that you tell the story, um, using your own personality and tailoring it to your audience that will make you a powerful storyteller. Audiences connect and respond to stories that reflect the basic themes of human nature. Good versus evil, uh, right versus wrong, humor, love stories, the ridiculous, life is absurd. There's even a thing called theater of the absurd. It was one of my subjects when I studied, um, which was really big in the 1950s. Or even how individuals triumph over the odds. Okay, We all like the underdog to win. And then there's those David and Goliath stories or revenge stories. Those rags to riches or riches to rags stories. Stories that show character and are hopeful and teach, inspire or move people or work. Let's look at six steps to great storytelling as told by broadcast consultant and talent coach Tommy Cromer. He says it looks easy and everybody talks about storytelling on the air, but only a small percentage of people on the air know how to be compelling when they open the mic or when they switch on the microphone. The great news though, as we said earlier, is that you don't have to be a born good storyteller. This is a skill that can be learned, which is what we're going to start doing now, is teaching you the, um, to use the tools that are there for, um, at your advantage. At its core, a story is simply a premise or a situation that leads to some sort of resolution. What makes the average person a poor storyteller is that there's no resolution, so no real ending at the end of the story. It just kind of slowly grinds down to a halt or abruptly stops, and then what? Most real people, and this includes um, guests on your show or callers that you'll have on your show, they can't tell stories. They have to sort of be tricked into it. Um, for a better result, don't try to solicit stories from them. Instead, say something compelling enough to either get an emotion or um, an opinion out of them in the course of the conversation. It's your job to wheedle those stories out of them. If we look at number one there, start with the ending. I've told you this before. As you prep something, start with the ending, then work back from there. If you were to write a crime novel, you'll start with who the killer was at the end of it and then work back to how it became that he was the killer, okay? So a mystery writer starts with knowing who did the crime. Then he simply writes the story that leads to that being revealed. So how do you write a story? You write it, ending, beginning, middle. So yes, I understand that beginning, middle, end is the standard story, okay, the standard description of how a story should unfold, but during the prep process, um, it should be ending, beginning, middle. Because unless you know where you're going, you're going nowhere, um, or you're going to be very, you're going to very likely wander off all over the place trying to find an off-ramp. Remember that the ending needs to be something that we haven't heard before. 
so many so-called stories on the radio start and end in the same way. So there's no real destination to our journey. To our journey. It's like we got in the car, we drove around the bar, block, and then we stopped right in front of the house where we started. Plus, when the story ends in something that you've already said, it takes away that element of surprise. And that specific element of surprise is something that many radio stations seem to have lost along the way, or they simply ignore it, or they've just never learned how to bring in that element of surprise in the first place. So that's the ending that you've done, right? Next comes the beginning. Because without a compelling opening thought, no one's ever going to stick around for the ending. The middle part then is about editing. You can take one step away from the main road, okay? But then you're coming back. Um, again, it's like driving. One detour and you can get back on the highway, no problem. Everything's fine. But if you take two detours in a row, you feel lost. On the air, what's going to happen now? Two side roads in a row means that your listener gets lost. Number two, put yourself lost. Don't start by talking about yourself. Either number one, start with the subject, or number two, start by referencing the listener. So instead of saying something like, I watched Idols last night, which in essence just means that you are talking about yourself, okay? Rather say something like, if you missed Idols last night, because what have I done now? I've tried to, to draw you in. And now, since you pulled the chair out for me, now we're free to relate. Um, and now you're free to relate your story to me. Or you can give me your opinion. Another example would be something like watching idols is like watching people run for head boy or head girl in high school. So that puts the subject on the table. Um, from there, with that touchstone established, you now have the license to give your take on what happened. Number three, never be typical. So say what only you would say about the specific subject. If someone else would say it, automatically reject it. Number four, use real language. Use the language that an actual human being will use in an everyday conversation. When you get presentational instead of conversational, you've lost me. Don't announce anything. Just talk to me like a real person would. So if we were at, a, um, at an event together and standing next to each other having a conversation, that's how I want you to talk to me on air. Number five, don't read to me. If you have to quote something, say that you're quoting it. Do it. Then immediately return to just talking to me. Radio is full of people reading magazines or reading out of a column or a News24 article. Just tell it to me in your own words. Then number six, which Tommy Cromer sees as the most important step, and this is the best thing that you'll ever learn from a storytelling angle. Number six then is find another camera angle. When a great film director walks around, watching the actors rehearse, he's constantly thinking, who do I show in this shot? Where am I going to put the camera? Someone like a George Lucas or a, or a Steven Spielberg draws up storyboards um, that are simply illustrations of what the camera angle for each scene will be. Here's how that camera angle thing works. Picture a parade. Most people in radio, um, and especially on television, describe things from one angle, so from the judge's booth, watching the floats as they go by, okay? You'll say something like, the specific one is the Roses Queen float. It's 10 meters long, made out of a million roses, and it took 94 workers 100 hours to complete, okay? This is both typical and boring. What if you take that story now, and you describe it from the um, person that is on the float's perspective. So the person on the float might be thinking, I've been waving to the crowd and smiling for, for a kilometer. My face muscles are screaming and man is my, my arm sore. And we still have another four kilometers to go. Or you can describe it from the perspective of the marching band walking in front of the float. Here the camera angle might be something like 
what is she going on about? What is she complaining about? Um, all she does is sit there and wave. But I have to walk another four kilometers and lug this two bar along. Each of these vantage points gives you a completely different view of the same event. The better and more adept you become at seeing different camera angles, the more interesting and engaging you'll be. Just mentally put yourself in someone else's shoes and describe how it looks like and feels like from there. Camera angles are hidden secrets uh, to great storytelling. Think about a situation where you and your picture, you and your friend having a conversation and the conversation turns sour because you believe that you are right and um, that her viewpoint is wrong. And now you're telling the story from your point of view when you are telling the story over for someone else. What if you change the viewpoint and you put yourself in your friend's shoes and see things from her point of view? How would that story change and how would you look in her eyes then or in his eyes, whatever it might be? And then let's change that angle again. You are someone that was sitting close by simply hearing this conversation. So you looked at both perspectives um, from your viewpoint. How would the story look like in that case? So there we have three different angles. There is at least one major way in which storytelling on a radio or a TV or a podcast or the internet, whatever it might be, differs from the kind of storytelling you might do around a dinner table. And that big difference is at a dinner table, it's considered very rude to leave if you're bored. But in real life or on any of those mediums I just mentioned, if you have not given me as a listener um, a reason to stay tuned to you, to listen to what you're saying, I'm not going to feel obligated to listen for long. So it's important that we look at a few essential things. First and foremost, if you are telling a story outside of breaking news, it's necessary to immediately engage and captivate your listeners. Think about the um, attention span. Okay, We said the average person's attention span is only eight seconds long. So as with anything that you put out on air, why should I listen to you? Why should I listen to this piece of content? Give a reason someone should listen to your story before you do anything else. If we look at an example, listen to this opening. If you've ever wondered whether you're really alone in the dressing room when you try on clothes, you'll want to know about the security guard who got arrested today. That will get me to listen 100% because I am that kind of person that will go into a dressing room and fit something on before buying it. And this will make me think twice about going into a dressing room <laughs> going forward. Okay, so that's the kind of opening that you need. How do you find the reason? Before any story goes to air, take it apart, look at the facts and try to see it from all the different angles. Who are the players involved in your story? How can you make the listener care about them? Because if you as a listener buy into my character, you're going to care, you're going to be involved in what happens to them in the future. Who will be affected by the outcome of what you have to say? Answer at least one of these questions and put it right up front. Start your story with that. Similar to the camera angle, one of the techniques to help people improve storytelling is called the prism method. Have you ever held up a, a crystal, any type of crystal, okay, held it up to the light? Um, what happens when you turn it around? The light bounces different colors um, and different ways on the wall with different patterns as you move it. And the while it's still the same crystal and it's the same light, the same wall that it's bouncing from, when you move the prism, it changes your perspective on the light and you see completely different patterns. Thinking of yourself as the prism through which the facts of your story will pass is a good way to imagine the many ways you can approach and tell the many sides to any story. There's a really good example in Valerie Geller's textbook on page 198 that I want us to look at. The example starts with Maggie, a reporter who waits at a shop to make a purchase. 
And she continues to stand there. Rachel, the owner of the store, is busy talking on the phone, making arrangements to close early tonight. Why? It turns out that Rachel has has to close at 3 p.m. because she's got to get to the airport to pick up her brother, or her twin brother, rather, his wife and their two-year-old daughter. As the conversation continues, the story unfolds. Maggie learns through eavesdropping that the siblings have not seen each other for 47 years. They were twins born in India, then were separated after their parents divorced. The mother brought the, the baby girl to England and the father took the boy to America. They hadn't seen each other once since and neither knew what happened to the other. One day, the woman's teenage daughter asked about her uncle and was curious about her grandfather. She went online and conducted an internet search. In less than four days, she'd located her mother's twin brother living in the United States. Tonight was the big reunion at the airport. Maggie was a reporter and this was a story. So she said, excuse me, but I couldn't help overhearing. When Maggie asked if she could come along for the reunion, the woman agreed. And that's when Maggie learned the rest of the saga. It turned out the brother had had a terrible life growing up in America. Their father, now deceased, had been an alcoholic and had never kept a job for more than a few months at a time. He'd had four marriages. There were times when the boy was forced to live on the road with his dad sleeping in their car. He'd gone hungry and had never finished a single school year in the same town. Since the young man had had such an unstable upbringing, Though he had steady employment, he chose not to marry until he was in his mid-40s. And he'd had his first child at 47. So, tonight, at the airport, the brother, his wife, and the small daughter were meeting his twin sister and her family for the first time. Now, there's no right or wrong way to tell the story, but you can use the PRISM method to find the best way for you to tell it. So if you think about the story that I just told you, what are the different angles that you can go in with? So they are the twins. You can go in with the twin angle. You can go in with the angle of unstable parenthood. You can go in with the angle of how easy it is nowadays to make contact with someone but because of the internet. So there are a lot of different ways that we can start the specific story. Maggie came up with three approaches while driving to the airport. The first was this idea that we are a global village. So with the internet, no matter how long someone's been missing, if you have the time or the patience to look with a bit of information, a bit of luck, a bit of luck and maybe a, a miracle, you can find someone. The second um, viewpoint she came up with is that studies show that twins often feel incomplete if separated even if it happens when they were infants. Do you ever wonder whether twins feel like two halves to one whole? If you are a twin, do you ever feel like you are missing your other half if you've been separated? And the third viewpoint, if you've never had a great parenting model, should you think twice about becoming a parent yourself? It's hard enough to be a good partner in a relationship, but if you've never seen love modeled or watched a healthy relationship, how can you be equipped or prepared to be a good husband or, or wife or partner even in a relationship? These are the three approaches that she came up with driving to the airport. And all of these would have been acceptable. But when Maggie actually saw the scene unfolding in front of her eyes at the airport, she knew that her entry point to the story is going to be the two-year-old girl. Let's look at the opening of her story as it unfolded on page 199. Two-year-old Liza, with her dazzling smile, big blue eyes and blonde curls, is sitting on her aunt Rachel's lap. Liza is exactly the same age her father and her aunt were when they were separated in India 47 years ago. That's how her story started. This is an example that just shows us by examining the story from all the potential angles and approaches, you can find the best, the most compelling way to tell it. By using the PRISM method, you are well on your way to becoming the most powerful storyteller that you can be.
okay? You don't always have to go in with the first straightforward vantage point that you see. Where do stories come from? There's a popular belief that everyone has a good story to tell. Unfortunately, having a good story only solves one part of the challenge. And due to this popular belief that everyone has one story to tell, uh, we came to have one of the most difficult and painful hours of radio ever with very good stories being told by people who cannot tell stories at all on air. And it didn't help that when these stories were being told, the, already, the announcer already gave away the whole story basically at the beginning um, in one sentence at the start of his program. That's why storytelling is such a discrete skill. All three basics of creating powerful radio principles apply. You need to tell the truth, you need to make it matter, and never be boring. Think back, what did I say? There are no boring stories, only boring storytellers. Okay, and to get to this, there are three more skills that you need to practice. Lots and lots of skills that we're giving you. If you learn these though, storytelling will get much easier. First and foremost, if you can learn to speak visually, emotionally engage your listener and use the word you instead of me, we or I, you will instantly become a more powerful storyteller. Why? Because if I'm taking the angle away from me and I'm putting you in the spotlight. I'm saying I'm telling the story from your perspective as you. Stories can come from anywhere. You can get stories from your classmates, from clients, from colleagues from researching on the internet, okay? But by far your biggest source of stories is you yourself. And no one can tell a story the way that you can from your perspective. Some of the best stories or content from your material come from our real life experiences, okay? Or from people that we know or experiences that we've heard or observed, okay? On page 201, Hapequist says, your life is full of relationships and everyone you know has at least one story. Make a list of everyone you've ever known. It may take a while and the list, it's a list that you're going to continually need to add to, but do a little by little each day. Start with your parents, grandparents, spouses, and all your relatives and work your way through to the more distant connections like your bosses, um, customers, club members, classmates, etc. After every name, write as many words as it takes to remind you of at least one associated story. Some names will generate more stories, but every story has power because it's real. Then when you need a story, you scan your list and you select stories that will work for your audience. Um, be able to tell a long and a short version of a story. Flesh out the details okay, in the story. Bring in the conflict and the drama but don't spare yourself. Think back and make a list of those emotional markers in your own life. We all have them. What times in your life were the most emotional, defying, um, defining, powerful or life-changing? You'll know because when you mentally relive them, you feel them in your heart and your gut. Some of those things, it, um, it might be a little bit uncomfortable for you, but as soon as you start reliving them, you literally feel them. And interestingly, what happens then is, if the stories are told well, that is exactly where the listener will feel them. The listener will feel them in their own hearts, in their own guts. And that's where most of our decisions are made from the emotional center. Can you remember a time when you were a know-it-all? Did you ever let someone down, step out of your comfort zone and succeed? Did you lose a love? lie? Did you cheat? Did you misjudge a situation? Um, what were the experiences that changed your life? If you ask yourself these questions or similar ones, you'll unearth memories which you can use to craft these stories for your show, for your advertisers. This, this is not only for if you are a communicator on air, okay? If you are an advertiser, you use this too to sell something, to sell a product. You can use this anywhere with your colleagues, with your employees. Write down just enough descriptions so you can restore a, recall a story later. Start doing it now and do it five minutes at a time each day, okay? So this is a great way for you to start um, working on becoming a great storyteller. So now that you have all these um, amazing pieces of, 
of content so that can become stories in your subconscious. How can you turn these into effective stories? Try focusing the stories using the following questions. The first question, who's the story about? Personalize your story. The most compelling stories aren't about a company or um, an institution or a campus. They're about a person. Make someone in your story a protagonist. Give out details about their personality. Give them a name and add visual contributors to them. Number two, where are we? Your audience wants to know. Once you tell them, they could follow the story more easily. So set the scene for your audience. Tell them the, the year, the date, the time, the place, the atmosphere. Is it a sunny day? Is it raining? What is the event? Are we at a wedding? Are we at a funeral? Am I sitting in class? And then have a short and a long version of your stories, okay? Be able to tell both. A longer version would obviously, obviously have a lot more of these types of details, but a shorter one would also carry a couple of details. Number three, what's the goal? What do your protagonists want to accomplish or what do they need? What do they want to change? What are their dreams? Make the goal clear to your audience. Give them a reason to care about um, its attainment. Number four, what's the obstacle? It doesn't always work out that way, but the journey towards a goal can be one from safety to danger, from known to the unknown. The obstacle is the challenge. It's a problem, a dilemma, a question. This conflict makes the story worth telling, gives it drama, or makes the comedy work. What is the process then of overcoming this obstacle? Your audience learns the most from how the protagonist overcomes an obstacle, okay? Because this is the method that teaches the lesson. Or what memories did the encounter trigger? What inner demons did the protagonist face? Think about it this in little steps at a time. Tell the truth. The magic is in the details. Are you showing instead of telling? Use an active voice. Telling your audience something was overcome with sadness or Telling that your audience that someone was overcome with sa sadness is not as involving as saying, as he heard the news, his lip quivered and a single tear ran down his cheek. That is way more effective, okay? So let your audience reach their own conclusions. Um, don't tell them how to feel. Give them the gift of discovery along the way. all overloaded with too much information okay it's just one of those facts touch our emotions though and you will get our attention if we laugh if we cry get angry um get sad become frightened shocked if we're in awe um if we're inspired or if we get energized we'll remember the story and the message that you wanted us to convey for longer number nine what's the point what is the point to your story is there an aha moment that allows the audience to discover a kernel of truth? At the conclusion, will your audience understand what the story, is, what the story was about? Um, will they have gained an insight? Think back to the Paul Harvey story that we listened to at the beginning. At the ending of all that, we found out that the person he was talking about was one of the best, one of, one of the world, world's most well-known um, Scientists, okay, Albert Einstein. Number 10, is there a clear call to action? What should the listener do to get the benefits you've just told them about in your story? What could the listener do to apply the insight to their own lives? Jeffrey Hedquist's questions will work well for um, telling something like a short story or writing a novel, but most broadcasters, so most presenters, don't really have the opportunity to tell long stories, okay? Telling long stories are rare unless you're on talk radio. The norm is short stories or even shorter stories. Luckily for us, storytelling doesn't require great windows of time. You can tell a story in 60 seconds if you're really good at storytelling. 
It's just about how you take that story and how you edit it, okay? How you take out probably most of it at the start, when you start editing your story. And you make sure that you only use descriptive language. You can read a very good example of this on page 204 by Trudy Ryder. And she is, um, she's a talk radio host and a writer for CBS Radio News Network. And she comes up with short form and long form stories. So go and read about her experiences and how, what she suggests that you should do when it comes to editing stories. The one thing to remember though is that when we speak about um, short stories, or when we speak about stories that can be 60 seconds or even 30 seconds, commercials count in those, okay? Commercials are some of the shortest forms of storytelling. That means that you can create an ad as a story. You can probably recall at least one 60 second spot that takes you two minutes to describe. Why is that? Because writing short is way more difficult than write, writing long. So it's easier to explain, explain something using long description than it is to put it back into that 30 second box. Okay, so this is something that you can learn to do with time. But if you can take someone on a complete journey in 30 to 60 seconds of airtime, you will be truly an adept storyteller. Think about your day to day. Think about all the different times or places rather where storytelling could make a real difference. And how many areas are you currently using storytelling? There is a need for good storytelling everywhere around us. And this is simply the beginning of that journey. So if we quickly recap what was said, because there's a lot of information shared within this lecture. Storytelling is one of the key points in the proven content, uh, in the proven creating powerful radio or powerful communicators process. So focus, engage, opinion or position and storytelling. Storytelling is used to entice the listener because it's been taught to us since childhood. There are no boring stories, only boring storytellers. The basics of storytelling has been covered already. So that was the who, the what, the where, when, why, how, plus the beginning, the middle, the end. However, the way the story is told with personality and tailoring it to the audience is the key to being a powerful storyteller. Stories reflect the basic themes of human nature, good versus evil, right versus wrong, humor, love, life's absurdities, triumph against all odds, rags to riches, riches to rags. And stories that succeed are about character, they inspire, give us hope, teach us, or move the members of the audience. And that brings us to the end of our first storytelling link. So I look forward to continuing this journey with you in the next class. Until then, please do me a favor and go and um, read up on stories, okay? Whether it's Paul Harvey or whether you go and read up on a couple of other storytellers. Start reading about them, separating them, breaking them up, trying to see what it is about each story that got you involved and how you can start coming up with these yourself. And with that, I say goodbye for today. Bye.